Well, welcome everybody to our second of the sessions on uh, Dyslexia for our Dyslexia Summit. We are excited to have both Scott Baker and Jess Searles join us today. And I'm just gonna turn it over to them to let them introduce themselves and get started. Oh yeah, hey everybody. Um, uh, my name's Scott Baker, I'm with Jess Searles. We're both from the National Center on Improving Lit Literacy, ENSOL. And we're, um, we're facilitating the second uh, of three um, sessions on, on dyslexia. The first, I hope you were able to attend, was on kind of background characteristics of dys dyslexia, which we'll, we'll um, talk a little bit about that today as well. And then the, the next session coming up in a couple of weeks is going to be on the connection between families and schools and how families and schools working together can support students with disabilities, including dyslexia. So today, um, Jess and I are going to share um, the, the, the job <laughs> of, of presenting information. Uh, I'm going to talk for a little bit about um, the, um, trying to click my slide here, just, no, there we, oh, I just had to click it. A little bit about, uh, well, I'll tell you about the objectives in a second, but um, before we do that, um, Jess, do you know about, do you know how, what people are supposed to do with this resources survey? Yeah, this is from um, my MTSS and they are trying to get some input on their um, resources around COVID-19. So if you um, have a moment, either during the presentation or after the presentation, you can queue, um, scan the QR code now um, with your phone or follow the link on the chat uh, or on the presentation. Um, and take the survey to let them know about um, how you're using those COVID-19 resources on their website um, and any feedback that you have around those resources. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> uh, I was supposed to do the first slides and then Jess comes in later, but I, I, I forgot what this one was about. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, uh, so I do know what this slide's about. Uh, this, so we're Jess and I are from Ensel, and our, our mission really is pretty straightforward. It's um, to... Um, increase access to and the use of what we call evidence-based approaches to screen students for problems, to identify um, kids with disabilities, including dyslexia, and perhaps from my perspective anyway, most importantly, to teach kids with literacy-related disabilities, to teach them both in their core program, core reading instruction, which we'll talk a lot about today, and in interventions for those students. That's the, that's the mission of Ensel. Uh, we've got a bunch of people on the team. Um, you can go to the website and, and look through the, any of these things um, to see what kinds of uh, focus areas we have, who the project managers are, who the various staff members are. Um, we're, Jess is on there somewhere. I don't think I am, which is good. <laughs> and you can see who the, who the, the, the leadership is, uh, our task areas. I work primarily on... Um, professional development and technical assistance down there, number four, uh, which is directed by Nancy Nelson. And um, this is part of our outreach, what we're doing right now. So there's a, there's a, um, a, a way for us to collect information on how the, um, these kinds of, of webinars, these sessions are working. And so we would like you to um, answer some questions. And I believe if you just um, take a few minutes right now uh, and answer these questions. We'll review them at the end and we'll see um, if you've learned anything <laughs> according, to, according to us. <laughs> so I'm, I think I'll give you probably two minutes to do that. Uh, Marissa or Jess, would you would you um, when when we're when you think it's uh, we've given them enough time, would you just just let me know? Sure. Okay. And then the and then I can I'll just I just delete I think this thing on my screen right beginning of session poll. Yeah. Two minutes I think is fine, don't you? I think so. We're we've got about five responses and we're about a minute in. Okay.
All right, Scott, we're at that two minute mark and we've got about a little over half our folks have responded. There's still a few more coming in. Do you wanna wait a few more seconds? Yeah, yeah, let's give them another minute or two. Okay. Yeah, I don't Thank mind, you. I think that's fine, yeah. All right, it seems to have slowed down, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. All right, it's closed. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. That's great. Uh, great. So thanks, everybody, for, for doing that. We'll have a chance to review um, the answers um, at the end. Um, but now we're going to talk a little bit about our objectives for today. And we have we have three uh, three major objectives, and they they're um, conceptually uh, the the centerpiece of our orientation towards um, supporting students in school settings who have reading difficulties, including kids with dyslexia. And we're going to argue in objective number one that um, school wide approaches, which have been around for probably 25 years now, there's a, there's a, there's a fairly robust literature on school-wide approaches to um, early academic difficulties, primarily reading, but also in mathematics and other subject areas, are really a way of orienting um, to effective practices that without some kind of school-wide approach, and we're going to argue that multi-tiered systems of support is uh, a really viable way of supporting all kids, including kids with dyslexia, that without some kind of school-wide approach like MTSS, it's gonna be very difficult to effectively support kids. And we'll, and we'll go into that in more detail. Then we're gonna talk about two specific types of practices that are, are central to supporting all kids. The first is our objective number two, which is to describe features of assessments. We're, there, we're gonna talk about four assessments that should be used with students. And we're gonna talk about two in depth, screening assessments and progress monitoring. And that hopefully that will become clear as we go. And then third, and perhaps most important, we're gonna talk about practices, evidence-based practices, instructional practices, intervention practices for kids uh, who are demonstrating characteristics of dyslexia, but these are practices that are gonna work for other students that are having difficulty and for kids who are not having difficulties. So that's gonna be a central theme throughout is how to support all students and not necessarily supporting kids who have difficulties in a drastically different way, but taking practices that are commonly used in schools and modifying those practices so they're supporting all kids, including kids with dyslexia. Those are the objectives. You all, which is, this is uh, very exciting, but you, you all in Michigan and in other states, if there are folks from other states here today, uh, there's a gro growing legislation around supporting students with dyslexia. And in your particular, in Michigan's particular dyslexia uh, law, which is being written right now, uh, you are talking about a lot of things that we're gonna talk about today, including uh, screening students in kindergarten through third grade, intervention for kids, multi-tiered systems of support as the vehicle for supporting all kids, progress monitoring, which we're gonna talk about today, and explicit instruction. So all of these features are uh, written about in the emerging legislation in Michigan. There are also features that are common in, in other states' legislation around dyslexia. Um, so there's a, there's a set of guiding principles nationwide that are um, honing in on how to support kids, inclu including kids with dyslexia. There's a bunch of resources that um, uh, will help um, 
in a lot of ways. It provides background knowledge, so, so it provides information for you so that you can build your own knowledge base around dyslexia. It also provides uh, tools that you can use, so these, the, the resources that we're gonna talk about, so that you can actually identify screening programs that are working for students. You can identify interventions. You can see how uh, the evaluations of interventions and screening systems are working. We're gonna talk about three categories, but there are um, several others that will probably come up in the presentation, but there's a lot in these three um, categories. The Institute for Education Sciences has a number of practice guides and other uh, types of services or other types of uh, information on programs, reading programs, intervention programs, core reading programs that uh, provide good um, evidence of what works and what doesn't work. Uh, so that's the Institute of Education Sciences. Here are a couple of websites around their that are on their practice guides, which are also, some of them are directly relevant. We've listed two directly relevant for students with disabilities, including dyslexia. Um, the National Center on Intensive Interventions, which has been around for quite a while now, NCII, they've got a, a really uh, wonderful website that has uh, all kinds of screening tools that you can, that you can, um, that you can um, examine and find screening measures that are rated in terms of their in terms of their quality the research quality that's been done those kinds of features uh, there's there are um, intervention tools uh, intervention programs intervention approaches that are on NCII's website uh, they have other kinds of um, uh, taxonomies that help organize thinking around uh, supporting students with dyslexia and the kinds of measures and interventions that should be used and our own website, the National Center on Improving Literacy, we've got uh, lots of lots of different sections that are organized around uh, state level support, district level support, school level support. Uh, we've got a family section. There's lots of um, lots of um, information graphics and briefs that we've written. Uh, that uh, infographics we call them that are are really organized around providing uh, concise information in a very digestible, visually oriented way. Um, so there's lot, lots of different ways, lots of different places that you can um, that you can go to to find more information on some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, let's just jump right into this into the issue of characteristics of dyslexia. Um, this is a new this is actually a new a new term that's being used and it's being used quite broadly. Uh, I uh, must admit to you, I didn't really like the term very much when uh, I first heard it. Uh, I uh, appreciate the fact that it's going to be a term now that's used and, and we're going to have to get comfortable talking about it. And so I'm going to work on that myself. Uh, and, the, the, uh, and there's a, a, a very good uh, resource, very good book. I highly recommend it by Seidenberg, 2017. It's called uh, Reading at the Speed of Light, colon, and then some other stuff. And it's, it's all about uh, um, reading research. It focuses specifically on dyslexia. Uh, he's a dyslexia scholar, Seidenberg is, and he has a very cogent um, section in his book on characteristics of dyslexia. And these are the, these are the six bullets there on the, on, uh, at the top of the slide. Uh, these are not measures, these are concepts. So they're, they're ideas, they're constructs. And there are measures that can be tied to these things, but I don't wanna talk about the measures right now. I wanna talk about the constructs. And so the six constructs are phonology, which is the sa sound system that, is, that, that alphabetic understanding is based on, reading aloud, so students being able, to, being able to read text aloud, processing speed, which is a complex um, construct that is linked to uh, kids who have difficulties learning to read, including dyslexia, processing speed. That's how quickly uh, individuals process information, essentially. Uh, orthography, which is the spe sound spelling patterns. Uh, working memory, which is basically allows um, individuals to hold information in their, in their working memory to use it as their processing information. So in reading, it's very, uh, this is very easy to understand by just thinking about what reading comprehension is. So to understand something that you're reading, you need to be able to hold certain amounts, certain pieces of information in your head, keep it there for a period of time while you're processing other information that you're reading. That's, that's what your working memory allows you to do. And then the large, very overarching construct of language. And that uh, this, th this is a ubiquitous term that's used in many different ways, but 
In this particular area, there are uh, characteristics of dyslexia that affect language development. Sometimes they're causal, sometimes they're, they're consequences of reading difficulty. Uh, but these are, the, these are the, the primary characteristics of dyslexia. Many of these will, be, will actually turn out to be um, areas that we measure with our, with our assessments of students. They'll be in screening measures, they'll be in progress monitoring measures, they'll be in uh, more intensive diagnostic measures. Um, and we'll talk about those things as we, as we go. The most important thing though, the most important thing about, about um, Seidenberg's approach to characteristics of dyslexia is that students who have who have dyslexia, who are identified in school contexts, have difficulty learning to read when they are provided with high quality instruction and intervention. There's a lot in this particular bullet, but the most important thing is that it rules out the, um, the practice of testing students for dyslexia at a single point in time. There are no tests for dyslexia, and there, there's really in the context of a legislation, national legislation and state level legislation, there, there needs to be in the, in the identification process, a close examination of how well students have, how, what kind of progress students have made learning to read in the presence of high quality instruction, that would be core reading instruction, for example, and intervention. That's essential, that's an essential feature and that's gonna be a theme that we talk, about, talk a lot about today. So the, the, um, the vehicle that we would uh, highly recommend for, for um, supporting all kids in school settings including students with dyslexia is some kind of school-wide approach. And the, and the dominant, the dominant school-wide approach these days is, is multi-tiered systems of support, multiple tiers, an overarching system. And we'll talk about why, uh, why we think that this is a viable way to support students, including kids with dyslexia. First of all, first of all, in, in, in multi-tiered systems of support, comprehensive systems that are, that are, that are uh, implemented well, all kids are included, all kids, not, not, um, not 399 out of 400, but all kids, all 400. Uh, it's, it's uh, MTSS is prevention oriented. The idea, the guiding idea behind MTSS and behind reading research now that's been done for over 50 years is that when we, when we identify students who are having difficulty early, not just kids with, with reading disabilities or learning disabilities or dyslexia, but any student who's having difficulty, when we identify those kids early and provide the support they need, high quality support, we can prevent small problems, small reading problems from growing into very large problems. The longer we wait, the bigger the problem is. Okay, MTSS is agnostic when it comes to um, the, the use of, of um, allocated resources like special education resources for supporting kids. It's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take a stand on that. MTSS, the MTSS approach is intended to provide instruction and intervention to kids when they need it. Um, not when they need it once they're eligible for, for support or anything like that. It's when they need it. So they need that support early on. And remember, I just said er, the earlier we can support kids, the better. That's when they should get it. It's comprehensive. MTSS is comprehensive. Every part of the school's infrastructure should be committed to providing high quality service. That is mostly translated into instruction and intervention. And that's certainly the case. And that's, that's going to be a big theme for us but it also includes leadership. It includes coaching and professional development. It includes formal evaluations of student reading, which most schools are doing, but also a serious commitment to examining implementation fidelity. So it covers every part of the school system in, in its ideal uh, formation, okay? You've all seen this triangle, I'm sure. This is an idealized version and this is absolutely fine. There are not a lot of schools that we work in where it, look, where it looks quite like this. It looks a little bit different. Uh, more kid, there are more kids that need support than, uh, than um, 
than uh, 18 to 20 percent that are, are that are showing up here. But it's a but it's a visual representation of how the system is supposed to work. Most kids should be supported successfully in the core reading program. That's tier one. A small number of kids, up to 15%, maybe more, should be supported effectively with a tier two intervention, which we call targeted level of prevention. So it's a targeted intervention. It's designed in essence to supplement what's being provided in tier one. Tier three is intensive. It's differentiated from tier two by being much more intensive. We'll talk about those features, but it's designed, because it's intensive, it's expensive. And so resource allocation needs to be for a fairly small percentage of kids. If you have 20, 30, 40% of your kids who are, who are showing up as needing intensive support, it's going to put really excessive demands on your system and it's going to be very hard to do that. So the intense intervention that we're conceptualizing in tier three is designed for a fairly small percentage of students who need it's really organized around the construct of individualized support for kids. So we look at kids very carefully, very individually, and provide intervention programs that are designed for their unique needs in mind. Kids, kids with disabilities get served all along the continuum. They're, they're, they should be part of tier one, especially in the early grades that we're talking about primarily today. They should be, they should be consistently uh, in tier one lessons. They may be receiving some tier two support. They're intensified interventions in tier three. They can, they can be all along this continuum of support uh, from, from tier one to tier three. Okay. The, this, the, this slide is, is really designed to make a point. It's probably one of the most um, well-known, most clearly researched areas of education, and maybe, maybe, maybe in psychology, I would, I would argue, that we know that, that prevention and early intervention of reading problems is an, is an evidence-based practice. When we can get to kids early and provide them with support, they can catch up to their peer, peers and they can, pe they can read on grade level. Uh, the longer we wait, the harder it is. That's basically what, what the, the, this slide is telling us. RTI, response to intervention, and multi-tiered systems of instruction, MTSS, in reading, are um, vehicles that are, that are organized around a prevention and early intervention system. That's, that's really what they're about. There is a disconnection between um, what we know Will, can work for kids and, and what actually occurs in practice. And so this is, this is something that you all at the school level really, uh, I hope, can have conversations about, uh, about, about this proposition that there's a disconnection between what we know is effective and what's actually implemented in schools. And there are many reasons for that. And, I, and we're not gonna talk a lot about those reasons um, uh, today necessarily, but the idea is that we do have a set of practices, a knowledge base that we can draw on. It's quite, it's been developed over many, many years. It's pretty robust. And it really, uh, and Jess will talk a lot about this. We know the content that we need to be teaching kids for them to be successful readers. And we know an awful lot about how to deliver that content. Jess is one of, is, an, is, is, has deep expertise, not only in the knowledge base, but in, in teaching this way. And I um, uh, she'll 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 be able she'll talk about that in a little bit. What Shaywitz talks about, which I kind of like, is this notion of an action gap. We we know what to do, we know how to do it, and now we just have to do it. And so if if and I know that this is sometimes controversial, but if you can hold that idea in mind for a while and just entertain the possibility and think about we know what to do, we know how to do it, now we have to get it done. MTSS provides a vehicle for that because it's a school wide organized system where everybody if it's done right, is on the same page providing services for all kids. Okay, this is a, a, a very nice visual, um, I, I think, that really um, illustrates a couple of key points. And, it, and, and, the, and the, uh, I'll, let, I'll let you digest this on your own over time because I've got I've to move on to screening in a minute. But the point here is to really understand that, the, that the, a multi-tiered system is intended to show alignment between tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three. You may be in a school where there's four tiers, that's fine. You may be in a school with, uh, that doesn't organize your tiers quite like this, that's fine. But the important point is that there's alignment. So as kids move from tier one to tier two, uh, there's alignment between, between um, those tiers. As kids move from tier two to tier three, there's alignment between tiers. 
the, the, the overarching construct is you go from tier one to tier three is intensification. So instruction and intervention becomes more intense for students when they move to higher tiers because their needs are greater. But there's always a consistent focus on what the core reading program is for all kids. So even kids who are receiving very intense interventions, uh, tier three, should be in the core reading program as well. They should be getting differentiated instruction during that differentiated time. They should be learning foundational skills like other kids. They're supported to do that through tier two and tier three, but it's got to link back to the core. Tier one, I'll let you read this. Uh, Jess will talk a lot about the five big ideas. Uh, she'll talk a lot about systematic and explicit instruction. Uh, that's the, that's the, the, the um, central dominating factors for tier one. Tier two, there's been a tremendous amount of research. We know a lot about how to provide tier two interventions for students. Um, the, the, the research base is robust. It's about, generally speaking, about in the early grades, 30 minutes a day, small group instruction. Um, uh, targeted, targeted supports for kids where they need it. And um, we know from good research that when this, these kinds of interventions are provided for students, they can learn quite well. Tier three is a little bit of a different story. It's more difficult. There's not as much research. The kids are farther behind. The interventions need to be more intense. That's typically a challenge for schools. We know from research from, from a number of very good studies that it's possible for kids who are um, um, significantly behind their peers if they get the intense, in, the intense instruction intervention they need, they can make what we call accelerated progress. In other words, they're making sufficient progress to catch up to their peers as long as they can make that progress over a relatively long duration. That's going to have to happen, but they can do it. There are studies that have been, uh, that have been conducted that show this. Uh, it's, not easy, it's, not, it's not easy, it's tough, and it does put resource demands on a school for sure. Uh, we're still exploring this in terms of the research base. We're still doing lots of, uh, lots of research on tier three. Um, um, uh, but the primary construct is intensification for kids when they, once they get to tier three. There's a practice guide I'd, I, I would uh, love for you to take a look at. There's um, evidence base for each of the recommendations. They have five from minimal evidence. That means that there's not a lot of solid support for the recommendation, but there's a lot of expertise that's, that uh, recommends this. There's moderate support for other things. And then there's a lot of support for certain things, including the small group, small group reading instruction for tier two that I was describing. Okay, I'm gonna spend about 10 minutes or so on, on um, uh, features of student assessments. And I'm gonna talk first of all about universal screening assessments. And I want to uh, make a couple of points. Um, this is fairly commonly accepted now. There's been a lot of interest in, in screening assessments. It's in most of the dyslexia legislation. And there are some um, variations in how states are approaching this. There are some, um, misconceptions for sure about screening. And there's some practices that I think are probably not in the best interest of a universal screening system. So we're gonna give you our version. And this is pretty close to what uh, Michigan is conceptualizing, which we think is, which, which is, which is a good thing. Uh, there are variations on this theme. And then obviously you're gonna to have to respond to what your state requirements are. But this is an, an idealized version that's pretty close to what uh, many screening systems are, are focusing on and the key principles. Okay, so the primary purpose, and this is one of the, one of the test questions, the primary purpose of universal screening is basically to identify which kids are at risk for long-term reading problems. Once they're identified as at risk, schools have to do something. They have to provide additional support for those students if they're gonna reduce the risk factors that these kids have. That's the most important thing about a universal screening system. To do that, the systems have to be efficient, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. The screening systems also can be used to identify which levels of support, tier one, tier two, tier three, students may need. So it helps, it helps determine tiers of support. It's also useful to monitor the overall health of a school's MTSS system. So you can use universal screening data to uh, determine how well your school's MTSS approach is working. Schools, my experience is schools don't take enough advantage of that feature. It's really easy to do. 
Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that today, but you can organize universal screening data, look at it over time, and come to some conclusions about the health, the overall health of your MTSSR system. If I had to pick one slide <laughs> that I was going to show in this in the in the in the talk today, I would I would choose this slide. It's a little out of context to be honest, but I want to present it to you because I, th this this from my perspective is really um, something. Uh, this is this is an issue that we all need to be mindful of as we think about that pyramid with three percent, three to five percent of the kids in in tier three who who. Many of those students may, may be kids with reading disabilities, including dyslexia. This is the problem in context, however. For a, 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 a very large percentage of our kids, and if you look at the national average, that's the far bar on the right. There are two bars. One is the state reading assessments. The other is the NAEP. We have anywhere between 40 and 50% of our kids who are proficient readers. That means more than our half, more than half of our kids are not reading proficiently in grade four. That's an astronomically large percentage, I would say. And we've got to, we've got to do something for all of those students because we, we want them to be proficient. I do not think that the proficiency standards are too, too challenging. I think they're reasonable. I think we can get there personally. Uh, but regardless, these are our standards. You can use the state standard if you want. You can use the national standard if you want. Uh, but but whatever standard you use, we're we're looking at more than fifty percent of our kids are not um, not reading proficiently. So MTSS, because it supports all kids, allows us to organize our reading approach to meet the needs of all these students, all of them. So the fifty percent of the kids who are reading proficiently the 50% of kids who are not reading proficiently, but we've got to be really strategic about it. And we've got to really be careful. We've got to really be mindful of implementing core instruction and intervention supports that are working for students who are not, so we're not going to bring these percentages down. So it's a broader, it's a broader problem for sure. And there are, there are kids, a small percentage that have, that have uh, learning disabilities, reading disabilities, including dyslexia. Those, those students are gonna need more support than other students for sure, but there's, a, but, there's, but there's a larger context to this. Okay, the four types of assessments, and this is, this is about all I'm gonna say about these four types. And I want you to think about the concept here and how these things go together. Universal screening, which we're gonna talk a lot about today. Who's at risk? Progress monitoring, are kids at risk making adequate progress? That's the big question that we're asking, okay? Those are the two types of assessments we're gonna talk about today. There are two others though. There's individual diagnostic assessments. There, this is the most controversial type of assessment with students and, and uh, it's just because we haven't defined it yet. One definition is that it's for those kids who are not making adequate progress. Not all kids need to be given a, a diagnostic assessment in this, in this version of the four assessments, right? It's only for those kids who are not making adequate progress. And the purpose for these longer, more time intensive, expensive, resource laden assessments, individual diagnostic assessments, is to really hone in on what instructional supports kids need. Based on their pattern of responses, we're going to we're going to tailor our individualized plan to what kids are really their strengths and weaknesses, essentially. Lesson mastery assessments is an increasingly common part of core reading programs and particularly intervention programs where we try to check on a regular basis could be weekly could be bi weekly sometimes it's even more more common sometimes maybe every other day are kids mastering the instructional content that they've just been taught. This is essential. And there are two things that can happen. One is that they're not mastering it. And then there needs to be some, some way of, of um, reteaching that content or doing something. Just leaving it, letting it go is probably not a good idea. So if we, know, if we know that kids are not mastering the content, we've got to do something. They may master it and move on and then, they'll, and, and then uh, continue to mas master additional content that comes. But frequently for kids who are having difficulty, they'll master it, but then they'll not retain it. And so we have to be aware of all those patterns. Lesson mastery data will, is, is completely aligned with what's being taught. And so we'll know uh, when, when kids are taught certain content, 
We'll, we assess them on that content and we see if they've mastered it. That's a central, we think, part of a, univer, uh, part of a comprehensive assessment system, these four kinds of assessments. We'll talk about universal screening and progress monitoring. Universal screening, the, 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 they're, all, they're, they're administered to all kids, so they must be brief, they should be reliable, valid, and research-based. And there's a, there's a number of, re, of, of uh, research-based, evidence-based screening measures now. NCII website that I was talking about before has lots of that information on the website. Um, the What Works Clearinghouse, which is part of the Institute for Education Sciences, also has information on screening measures. Uh, but they're brief assessments. We administer assessments that take one or two minutes. So they're really quick. They're very good at doing what they're supposed to do which is identifying those kids who are on track, identifying those kids who are at risk, some level of risk. And from there, we make decisions about the support, that, the support that kids need. Because they're brief and time efficient, it's very feasible to administer these assessments multiple times per year. Some schools maybe only do it once. I would recommend doing it more than that for several reasons. Uh, one, one of the most important is that you can begin to evaluate how effective your interventions have been, your instruction and intervention supports for students. If you administer them in the, in the fall and spring, for example, we typically recommend because schools can do this efficiently, a fall, winter, and spring assessment, um, free, uh, assessment time points. Okay, here, this is, a, this is a visual representation. This is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. The idea, and I would recommend a system like this, uh, organizing data into categories. And we, we typically use green, yellow, and red. And here, the, the visual is designed to help us group kids into three categories, essentially, based on their screening scores. The kids who are on track, which are represented by green, are kids who are reading at benchmark or greater. Those are kids who are generally going to respond positively to tier one instruction. They won't need a tier two or tier three supports. This is not always the case, but it's generally true. And those kids, if their screen is being on track, your, your, your goal is to keep those kids on track. We're starting to work with percentages now of what percentage of kids should stay on track if they're on track in the fall. And most of the people that I've been talking to, experts and lay people alike, are um, in the high, in the 90s. We, like nine, eight, we say 85 at some point, sometimes 95. We're getting data on this, but getting kids, getting keeping kids who on track, who are starting on track, is really critical. We don't want to lose those students. And then simultaneously, once we get kids who are not on track, like we get kids who are at some risk to on track, we want to keep them there. Kids in yellow are, are below benchmark, typically not well below benchmark, and so their risk level is less intense than the students who are, are coded as red. These kids, generally speaking, should do well in a, tier, in a tier two intervention. Tier one plus tier two, those students, many of those students um, should make sufficient progress so that eventually the tier two support uh, can be reduced and maybe in some cases eliminated. It may not be true for all students. You may and and teams of professionals and parents should should be making these decisions of whether, when, and how to reduce the um, um, the um, support that's provided through the tier two system. There may be some kids who are gonna need periodic support through tier two. There may be some kids who once they're, they're finished with the tier two intervention are fine. They're gonna stay in the green zone for the rest of their reading careers. And maybe other kids who are more complex than that. Students in the red zone are kids who are uh, going to need some uh, additional intensification of the intervention. Early on, this may come through a tier two system if they're in kindergarten or first grade. Later on, as they get older, uh, they're gonna be farther behind. And so they're probably gonna need a pretty intense intervention. Even if you don't have progress monitoring data on these students, they may need a pretty intense intervention along with tier one to support, uh, to support them. And hopefully that percentage is relatively small because as I say, it's pretty resource intensive. Okay, 
So uh, these are these are measures. Now these are these are screening measures um, that are commonly used. If you look, if you think back to the slide on the characteristics of dyslexia, you'll see that a lot of these things are aligning with those constructs. So have letter naming, which can serve as an, a measure of alphabetic understanding. It's also increasingly being used as a rapid automatized naming measure, RAM, that's processing speed. Um, letter sound fluency is an alphabetic understanding measure. How well do kids understand the relationship between sounds and letters? Uh, phonemic segmentation is a very important measure of phonological awareness. It uh, doesn't involve print. These are all um, measures that can be administered reliably in a very short period of time. If the data is used well, effectively, if it's being used, they can be very valid measures for supporting students, okay? So we have measures of, of alphabetic understanding. We have measures of a phonological awareness. We have word identification measures. The bottleneck for most students with reading difficulties, including students with, di with dyslexia, is word identification. It's a word level reading disability. Now, it may be very disfluent reading, um, that, may, that may be how it's manifested, but it's a word level reading um, disability, uh, dyslexia is. We have measures of, of uh, nonsense word fluency, which is another measure of alphabetic understanding, kind of a pure measure of decoding. And then we have uh, comprehension measures, which are represented by maze or maze fluency tasks. So those are all, ex these are examples of the kinds of measures that can be used as screeners, okay? I'm gonna leave you with four, I'm gonna turn this over to Jess in just a second. Um, but I want to leave you with four infographics that you can take a look at. These are all on our website, and they're um, issues around um, uh, other other important co uh, concepts in terms of screening, right? And 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 you can you can look and see, and there'll be some breakdowns in terms of grade levels that um, the what what sorts of measures should be administered at different grade levels, things like that. Okay. So the first one. Oh, I'm sorry. How do I go back? Oh, there we go. Uh, database decision making, that's another, uh, another key concept here. The bottom line with this is that the, uh, many schools collect a lot of data that they don't use. And this is, a, uh, to be perfectly honest, it's kind of a waste of time. Like you, you, you should be really um, working together, cognizant of the data you're collecting and using it. So database decision making is the use of data in a very appropriate sort of um, valid way. Validity is usually the term that we use associate with that. Uh, and there's a there's a there's an infographic about that on our on our website. Reliability is very straightforward. It, reliability is easily summarized by numbers. So and these four examples of reliability are uh, example examples that you can generate numbers to. Reliability, if you're looking for a kind of a ballpark sort of figure, well, like what kind of numbers are we talking about? Good measures should be in the at least 80% reliable, 90% um, is better. That's pretty achievable for these kinds of things. Internal consistency, alternate form, test, retest, iterator. Reliability is relatively straightforward. And it's something that's uh, kind, of, um, kind of a low hanging fruit at this point. Like we should be using measures that are reliable. Validity is a little more complicated because it involved, typically involves judgments. The best way to think about validity from my perspective is to, to examine whether the, the uh, decisions that a school is making about a student based on test scores are improving that student's outcomes in some way. So if your decisions are leading to better reading growth for kids, if your decisions are leading to better reading outcomes for kids, then you've got the, the, the highest level of validity evidence that you can have. We can, we can quantify validity in terms of numbers in a lot of different ways, but the most important thing is to think about the use of test scores. And if you're using assessments and test scores in a way that's improving outcomes for students, you should feel good about that, first of all, and you have evidence of the, the validity of the approach that you're using. The uh, NCII um, website has lots of information, additional information about validity. They use a color-coded scheme, which is quite nice. Full circles are the best. Empty circles are, are not so good, uh, where you can look through a lot of different measures and see how they stand on number of different uh, elements. This is organized quite well. 
Um, it's pretty digestible, I would say. There's a lot of information there. So you want to, um, I, I typically go in with an idea of what I want to get out of my search at that particular point in time. Um, but it's but it's run by really good people. It's a good it's a good website. You can have confidence that it's giving you good information. Um, Jess, I think this is you. Hey, Je do I do something, Jess? No, you're fine. I was trying. I was typing in the chat box to Melissa to see if she oh, would unmute me. It wouldn't let me unmute myself. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, this is me, Scott. Sorry, I couldn't get myself off mute. I forgot to tell you all about the chat. Did you mute me, um, Melissa? No. Oh, no, I forgot to tell you chat. about the chat. So, Jess, do you want to? I mean, I, I'm going to look at the chat now. I get. I think is that, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? Yeah. There's a. There's actually a question there before we move on. There's a question about. Okay, uh, why was the one brief titled behavioral considerations in universal screening? Um, trying to understand the use of the word behavioral. Yeah, I know. It's, I, I felt the same thing when I saw that. Um, because the, it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not behavior in the sense of like be, uh, social skills or, or um, non-academic behavior. It's, it's, behavior, it's behavioral in the sense that these are behaviors that we can observe. So they're things that kids are doing. Kids are reading aloud. They're answering questions about something. So it's, be, it's observable academic behaviors is really the, is really the idea. So the, inference, the inferences about what students know or don't know is relatively low. We're, what, we're, we're observing them do academic tasks and organizing their responses in relation to that. Thanks, Scott. All right, and yeah, Scott, you can monitor the question and answer part um, in the session and then um, the chat box too. I've been kind of doing back and forth and answering some things as you were presenting. So you can okay. take that over now, I'll pass it off to you. All Thank right. you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and jump into features of evidence-based practices and really looking at supports for students with characteristics for, of dyslexia or students who are identified um, as having dyslexia. So kind of paralleling to what Scott was talking about in, in assessment and looking at using assessment to really find um, that universal screening assessment to find who are the students that are at risk for um, reading difficulties, including dyslexia. We'll talk about instruction for all students and then kind of pair down to um, intensification of instruction. And then Scott will come back and kind of wrap up our session today with how to tie some more intensive instruction um, two more intensive assessments for students as they need that. So we'll kind of look at um, a, a continuum across those tiers of support in this um, part of the presentation. So opening up kind of with a simple view of reading, um, Goff and Turner, Turner um, in around 1986 um, actually proposed the simple view of reading to really clarify the role of decoding um, and how it plays into reading comprehension. So often um, <clears throat> what they were finding is in education, we kind of skip over the importance of this decoding piece for reading comprehension, and they really wanted to bring that back to the surface and bring some awareness to that. So um, rather than telling students if they um, encounter a word that they don't know, rather than telling them to skip the word or um, guess the word based on the first letter of the word or looking at the pictures, they really brought to the forefront the importance of really the, um, honing in on decoding skills and really decoding the word all the way through. So using all of those letter sound relationships um, to decode the word accurately, to transform that print into spoken language. Um, and that the importance of that for to be a good skilled reader. We know um, poor readers, a strategy of that is to guess and to skip and to move on actual um, word, students who are really fluent in their reading do really hone in on those decoding strategies. And then also the importance of language comprehension. So that ability to understand spoken language that really get to um, kind of the product of reading comprehension, that fluent execution and coordination of word recognition and text comprehension. And the way that um, they set up this uh, equation for simple view of reading was as a multiplication um, problem. Because as we know, if we multiply anything times zero, we get zero. And they wanted to kind of convey that through this um, equation that if my decoding is zero 
or my language comprehension is zero, my reading comprehension is going to be zero. So it really takes kind of filling both of these buckets or both of these components, the decoding and the language comprehension to truly comprehend um, what we're reading. And then reading is a multifaceted skill. It has lots of different parts and components to it, some nuances um, to reading. And it's kind of impressive that our brains even know how to read text. Um, but, but we can be taught to do that, which is really cool. Um, so really looking at the gradual um, acquisition of these skills over years of instruction and practice. So as we kind of peel back the layers to the simple view of reading, looking at decoding skills um, and breaking those kind of apart and looking at the different components of those decoding skills. Print concepts is one of those pieces of decoding skills. So understanding the organization and basic um, features of print. So print directionality, moving from left to right on the page. Um, words are make up sentences, really understanding how concepts of print work. Phonological awareness, phono is sound, logical is sense, so it's making sense of sounds, um, and that can be done at a spoken word level, a syllable level, or a sound level, or phoneme level. A phoneme is the smallest unit of speech um, in our language, so really understanding how those sounds work at the different levels of phonological awareness. Phonics and word recognition. So looking at knowing and applying grade level phonics and word analysis skills um, and decoding words. And then word knowledge building site vocabulary. So the idea of this um, idea of site vocabulary, not meaning that I've memorized all these things and all these words, but it really is that what can I recall in a really short amount of time? Um, and that really flows into the next section, which is fluency, accuracy, rate, and expression. So I'm reading with accuracy and fluency that will then support comprehension of what I'm reading. And when we're thinking about students um, with characteristics of dyslexia or who are um, at risk for, for dyslexia, really thinking about these phonological awareness, phonics, word recognition, and how those tie into that word knowledge and fluency. Often um, it's that phonological processing that really needs additional support for students at risk for dyslexia. So looking at our um, alphabetic writing system in written code, which in our case is English, um, it is pretty complex. So we're just going to look in and kind of zoom in on all these little pieces that have to work in tandem with one another for us to be able to decipher the words that we're reading. So um, in our language, we have 26 letters, A through Z, um, the alphabet that we use in English. And out of those 26 letters, we can make 44 phonemes. And phonemes, again, are that single, that unit of speech, the smallest units of speech that we have in English. So we use these 26 letters to make 44 sounds in speech. And then kind of overlaid on that are 250 graphemes. And graphemes are the written sound relationships. So for example, for the phoneme, mm, I could have it written with an N, or I could have it written as a KN, that's a grapheme, the written K and the written N, or GN, which is another grapheme, the writing um, that symbolizes that phoneme, that sound in our language. So N, the sound for N has three different graphemes that we could use, N, GN, and KN could all make that N phoneme or that N sound. And then on top of that, we have about 200,000 words that we use in our English language. So as we're talking about students with um, at risk for dyslexia, we're talking about taking these 26 letters, mapping them onto these 44 phonemes and 250 different written ways to then comprise these 200,000 words. Lots going on in our brains. And it's really this area that we really have to kind of hone in on for all students who are learning to read, but especially students at risk for dyslexia. So um, here, we're going to have you just kind of think through, I'll give you a little bit of think time. The word Doug, how many letters out of those 26 does it have? So just think in your head. Hopefully you came up with three. It has the letter D, U, and G. Phonemes, how many sounds do you hear in the word Doug? It also has three, D, U, uh, G, so three phonemes. And then graphemes are D, the written, the written symbol for D, uh, the, the U, the written sound for uh, and the G, the written letter or the grapheme for G. Now it gets a little more complex. Known, how many um, letters are in the word known? So out of our 26 letters in the alphabet, there are five there. And then looking at how many sounds. So say the sounds in known in your head, think about how many sounds there are. There are three, 
N O N. And then those graphemes map on. So we have the K N representing the N phoneme, the O W representing the O phoneme, the long O, and the N is represented by that N, the grapheme written symbol of N. Last one is jumped. So think about how many letters. There are six, A through Z. How many phonemes? There are five in that word. And then we can look at the graphemes that make up those phonemes. So we have the J for J, the U for A, uh, the M for M, mm, the P for P. And then that ED makes a T sound. So a little bit tricky there because that suffix makes a kind of a funky sound in that word. Um, so again, thinking about those graphemes and phonemes to make up three of the 200,000 words we have in our English language. Now we'll look a little bit more at the language comprehension piece. So as we look at the language comprehension, looking at academic language skills, inferential language skills are part of that. So being able to infer information that's not actually given to us in the text literal comprehension skills, which means it's right there in the text. We can find exactly the information we're looking for in the text. Narrative language is really looking at that series of events. So you may think about um, like a five point retell, who are the characters, what's the setting, what happens at the beginning, the middle and the end would be kind of that narrative text structure. Academic vocabulary. So thinking about using um, academic vocabulary and reading, writing, speaking and listening. So all of those areas of language. And then background knowledge, and that differs from student to student, classroom to classroom. All of our background knowledge is a little bit different, and we do have to think about um, building students' background knowledge when we get into some of that um, topic-specific language or stories that we're reading about, trying to build students' background um, by presenting pictures or videos or talking to them about their experiences, really trying to prime that background knowledge. So in this video, we're going to watch um, some elements of the decoding piece and the, the language comprehension piece to really talk about that um, comprehension for reading comprehension of what students are reading. And in this video, you're going to see um, kind of a range of grades from kinder to third grade. Kindergarten will be looking at phonemic awareness and just know that that's not necessarily directly tied to the third grade um, examples in vocabulary and comprehension, although those skills will kind of be tweaked and refined by the time those students get to third grade. These lessons aren't like directly connected to one another, but you'll just see little snippets of um, those decoding and those language comprehension skills um, in this video. So as you're watching it, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you so you can see um, the video. But as you are watching the video, Think about what components of that decoding and that word, that decoding or word recognition is being taught and what parts of language comprehension are you seeing taught? Are there multiple opportunities for students to practice? How are they engaging in the learning? What is the application of skills that you see there? And then how are teachers um, responding to data? So you'll see them kind of gathering formal, um, kind of informative data as they're going through the lessons. So. Are they using data? And if so, how are they using that data as they go through their lesson? Um, and as you're watching, I'll give you a, a couple um, minutes at the end of the video to kind of just chat out some of the things that you've seen in the video. So here you go. I'll go ahead and share it with you so you can see it. Okay, here we go. W in win. Am ham. W edge wedge. <laughs> Tricky. Yay. Here we go. K er ab. Crab. Wow. Okay, okay, we're each gonna get a turn. D'Angelo. In. Win. Josiah. Rr ig. Rig. <gasps> Wonderful. That was strong. Give yourselves a strong clap. One, One two, two, three. three. Huh. Nice. Ready? We're going to practice saying sounds. When I point to the sound, say the sound in your head. When I tap under the sound, you will say the sound out loud. My turn. Sound. I. Sound. E. Your turn. Sound. I. Sound. E. Oh, wait for the tap. Sound. E. e. Sound. I. Sound. I. I. So, my turn. Sound. I. Your turn. Sound. I. Yeah. Ready? Sound. E. Sound. I. Sound. I. 
Okay. Nice job. Let's try some individual turns. I will point next to the sound. I will call one student. Only that student says the sound out loud. Sound. Armando. I. Beautiful. Sound. Eric. I. Sound. Think about it. Sound. Michaela. I. Nice job. Fit in a jet kit. Go ahead and take a moment. Read this book in a whisper voice to yourself so I can hear you read it. I want it not super in your head whisper. I want to hear it a little bit. So like, kid, kid. That way I can hear you read it. done. You know what I noticed? I saw a couple kids when they were reading, they stopped and they went back and they blended that word one more time just to make sure that they got that word right and I think that's really awesome. Uh, Maya. Can he fit in a jet kit? Ooh, I like the way she read that. That one ended with a question mark and she said, can he fit in a jet kit? She read it like it was a question. Nice job. Turn the page. Ooh. Okay, we're on to our last word. Our last word is hardly. What's the word? Hardly. Emmanuel, what's the word? Hardly. Hardly. I have a picture for you. Hardly means not very much. I hardly do that. Or I hardly go to visit that place. In this picture, some light bulbs use a lot of energy. Some bulbs use hardly any energy. So hardly means just a little bit. Okay. So maybe there was something you used to do all the time when you were little. And now maybe you hardly do that thing anymore. Can you try to think about something you used to do a lot when you were in kindergarten, first grade, preschool, and now you hardly do it. You don't do it very much. Give a thumbs up once you've had enough time to think about it. Jonathan, can you use a sentence for me? I hardly. So I hardly ever use my roller skates anymore because I used to use them a lot because when I got them, I was super excited and I used them for two months straight. But when we moved, it, was, it got really complicated to use them anymore because we hardly had any wood floor. I want us to, I want to remind you of what our focus is today. Today we are really going to determine that story structure. Take just a minute to look at our different parts of story structure to remind us of the parts that we're going to be looking for today. Belinda, what is something you notice that's part of story structure that we're going to work on today? The beginning, middle, and the end. The beginning, the middle, and the end. And what do we call that, Cece, when it's the beginning, the middle, and the end? A plot. The plot of the story. Morales, what else are we going to be looking at? We're going to be looking at the plot. What else are we going to be looking at today? The characters. The characters. Who's in the story. And Chris, what else are we going to be working on? Um, setting. Setting. Ooh. What is setting, Abigail? Outside or inside. Okay, yeah, where the story takes place. So we're going to focus on where the story takes place or setting, the characters in our story, and we're going to look at just one of the chapters from Judy Moody and determine what happens at the beginning, the middle, and the end. All right, so we're going to have a little bit of a pause and reflect time. I know Scott and I have been talking at you for quite a little bit, so I'm going to pause, let you have some think time, um, and what are some of those components of the simple view of reading did you see in the video? So you do have the simple view of reading down at the bottom of this screen, thinking about decoding skills, language comprehension skills to really help students with reading comprehension development. And then sometimes just reflect on how this is similar and different to the content being taught in your classroom, your school, or your district. Um, so I'm going to pause here, let you think on that for a little bit. Feel free to um, type in the chat box or in the questions and the answers if you have questions about the video or content that you saw. Um, and I'll just kind of pause, let you think about what components did you see and enter that into the chat box. And then how did you see students practicing? How are they engaged? I'll pause there and give you some think time.
see any questions coming through yet or anything in the chat box, but if you do have any, I'll give you a couple of seconds. All right, so we'll continue through. If you do have questions as we go through, do feel free to utilize that chat box to share out any thoughts that you have um, or your question and answer section too, if you have any questions as we go through the remainder of um, the presentation today. So looking at your next slide, thinking about um, the changing emphasis. So as we look at these decoding and these language comprehension skills, um, the emphasis of those skills just change based on um, grade. So thinking through, and this is from the Intensifying Literacy Instruction Essential Practices Guide that my MTSS has um, recently put out for you all to access. But as you can see in um, the, this diagram, you have your print concepts that are really hard in kinder and first, along with phonological awareness, um, including that phonemic awareness, which is the cubes that was happening in this kindergarten video that we just watched. And you can see the little squiggly lines say that there's ongoing use, um, skill references and transfer into new contexts. So students were still using what they knew about phonological awareness into like second and third grade as they become readers, but it's not explicitly taught um, during that section of um, whole group tier one instruction necessarily, but students are still referencing skills um, in their comprehension and their reading development potentially in that third grade lesson as well. And then looking at um, your basic um, decoding skills, your fluency, and how that's being built as kind of those shifts in continuum and that shift in emphasis changes from grade to grade. And then you can see again that language comprehension that's happening from kindergarten pre-K all the way through 12th grade. Um, it may look a little different how those skills are built from kinder or pre-K to 12th. But that oral language and comprehension vocabulary development is happening alongside these other skills being taught. We're not waiting for students to finish all of their decoding learning before they can do their oral language and that um, comprehension kind of bucket of their, that language comprehension bucket of that um, the simple view of reading. They're really building those with alongside one another. So that's happening across that continuum pre-K to 12 for that vocab and comprehension and language development of academic vocabulary. So as we're thinking about students um, at risk for dyslexia or students who have been identified as having dyslexia, we're really doing everything we can to help students master phonological awareness and phonics in those earlier grades, as you can see kind of on the left-hand side of your screen usually kindergarten and first grade. Those are foundational skills that fluency and vocabulary and comprehension are going to be built on as students start doing more of that work kind of independently. And then by second or third grade, really shifting um, that learning from learning to read to reading to learn and bringing those decoding skills into that um, reading to learn arena. Research that we have shows that careful database adjustments to this instruction, to what we need to teach and how we teach it improves learning for students with dyslexia. So to adjust what we teach, we can intensify instruction in these critical reading areas that are important for all readers, taking into consideration each student's specific learning difficulty or specific reading difficulty. Um, and we're going to talk more about that as we change emphasis based on need. So we can change that emphasis based on grade, also that emphasis based on need. So when we're thinking about typical learners in a tier one reading instruction setting, um, there is there are those systematic relationships between sounds and printed letters. Students are using that knowledge to kind of break the code of reading as they're fluently reading words to where they become more easily and more automatically decoded and read to get to that comprehension of um, that students are reading, really focusing more and more attention on uncovering the meaning of the text that they're reading as those decoding skills become more solidified. Students who um, are at risk or have dyslexia may struggle with any component of that reading um, skill progression and development but typically they're at that individual word level, which is what Scott was talking about a little earlier in his section. It's really being um, that individual word level is at the core of um, their reading struggle and that struggle to learn to read and comprehend. So as we look at students um, who are at risk with, for reading difficulties, including dyslexia, really thinking about um, students who are having hearing, uh, difficulty hearing and manipulating sounds, which makes it difficult to link those sounds to their graphemes or their letter combinations that are written. 
which then leads to difficulty reading words and reading with accuracy and fluency because of that phonological processing and that difficulty in individual word level um, reading. And then that would also lead to difficulty understanding texts, which, which can lead to difficulty with comprehension, vocabulary, and then also may result in some social, emotional, and behavioral difficulties. So this kind of difficulty of this uh, at this word reading level really does have cascading effects and it could have um, impacts on comprehension, could have impacts on vocabulary. So we may see it kind of surfacing in those areas even though the root cause is really more in that word reading level, um, kind of space of reading for students with dyslexia. So thinking about um, that triangle, again, kind of calling you back to, to where Scott was at the beginning of this um, presentation, thinking about tier one and that bottom green level of the triangle, um, really making sure that we're adopting research-based curriculum to address students during that core um, level of prevention, that tier one level of prevention. And then beyond that in tier two and tier three, when we're thinking about um, the content that we're teaching in that section of the triangle for that yellow and red kind of version of the triangle, tier two and tier three, looking at scientific studies that have been conducted, demonstrating improved student outcomes in the curricula that we're choosing at those tier two and tier three levels. And to help with that in CII, again, I know Scott talked a little bit about this with the screening measures. They also have a tool for academic intervention tools chart. So very much like the screening tools chart that Scott shared earlier, um, NCII also has a chart very much like that structured in a very similar manner um, to show what programs have kind of been validated to um, work with students in intervention. So you can use that tools chart to search for um, specific intervention programs, and then again, use those little um, colored in dots to look at what the data says about each of those programs and what research validates those programs at the tier two and tier three level. So then moving into, we've talked about what to teach. Now let's talk about how to teach. So as we're looking at how to teach instruction and intervention across tiers um, within tier one, tier two, and tier three, and really focusing on those evidence-based practices and materials, like we can find in that tools chart in the previous slide, to impact students at those multiple levels and providing intensive supports to students who are struggling with reading. So as we look at how to teach, thinking about explicit and systematic instruction. So this just kind of breaks down each of those components. Explicit instruction is stated clearly and in detail. It leaves no room for confusion, no room for doubt. We are very clear to what the students are learning. Systematic instruction has a, or shows and involves a system, a method, or a plan. So there's a very calculated system in place to how we're teaching students um, each of these decoding and these language comprehension um, pieces of the puzzle. And then instruction is the act or the practice or the art of teaching. So how are we teaching um, students these decoding and these language comprehension skills? Explicit and systematic instruction are made up of some high leverage instructional practices, and these can be used and should be used tier one, tier two, and tier three. So when we're thinking about explicit and systematic instruction, really infusing some of these high leverage instructional practices into instruction at each of those layers of prevention. So this is kind of divided into two categories here. One is highly focused and purposeful use of instructional language and the other is strategies to improve student engagement. So as we kind of break down this highly focused and purposeful use of language, thinking about learning objectives and explanations, keeping them short and to the point, and we're very clear and concise with our learning targets that students are learning, but we're making it very obvious to students what they're learning about. So telling them the learning target, telling them what we're working on. And then modeling of the content. So doing some I do's, showing students exactly what we want them to do and the learning task that is um, being presented to them. And then multiple opportunities for all students to practice the content. So just as you saw in the video that we watched a few minutes ago, all students are responding, all students are practicing the content, multiple practice opportunities throughout tier one, tier two, and tier three instruction. Then kind of the second part of this is strategies to improve student engagement. So how can we keep students engaged in the learning? By deliberately and carefully designing review of previous content. So making sure that we are doing some judicious review, keeping students reviewing content that they've learned prior and tying it to new content that they are learning um, in the lesson at hand. 
immediate error correction. And you saw some examples of that in the video as well, um, providing students with the error correction, providing them with um, some scaffolded language around what the correct answer is and some additional practice to be able to practice that content correctly before moving on. And then checks for understanding. So again, that formative check-in with students. Are they mastering the content that we're teaching or are they not yet mastering it? And then tailoring and adjusting our instruction accordingly. So as we look at these um, instructional practices, we're going to do a little activity here to kind of model what this would look like. What does it look like when we have an explanation and a model and a chance for you to practice and more chances for you to practice and more chances for you to practice. And then that error correction and check for understanding. So Scott referenced the practice guide a little earlier he, um, in the session for the multi-tiered systems support and reading. This is an IES practice guide for foundational skills to support reading and understanding kindergarten through third grade. And this is pulling out recommendation two, which is an area we would focus in on if we have students who are at risk for dyslexia or students who had been identified with dyslexia, really helping develop that awareness of the segments of sounds and speech and how they link to letters. So in this action step in the practice guide, students are using word building and other activities to link the knowledge of letter sound relationships with phonemic awareness and making that connection um, very explicit for students and providing that scaffolding and that support as they need it. So in this particular um, lesson, I'm going to go ahead and have you type into the chat box here too. Uh, I'll model one for you and then we'll do a couple of these just so you can kind of see how this would work. Um, it works virtually like you'll see now. And then if you have um, students in your classrooms, you could have them write their um, answers on whiteboards and hold it up instead of typing in the chat box. Um, or if you have them virtually and they all have their own whiteboard, they could hold up their whiteboard and show you the answers on the whiteboard through their little Zoom screens. So it could be used virtually, it could be used in person. So here we go. I'll show you how to, here we go. Um, look at the letter tiles, F, T, N, a and C. You're going to practice making words. I'll give you a clue. I'll type the word that fits my clue in the chat box. When I say three, two, one, show me, I'll press enter so you can see my answer. Then you'll do the same. I'll show you how to do the first one. My turn. I'm thinking of a word that rhymes with cat. If I replace the k with f, it will make a new word. What word? I replace the k with f in cat. So I'm going to type my answer in the chat box. Three, two, one, enter. And you can all see my answer. Now it's your turn. I'm thinking of a word. Change a letter in fat to make it say fan. Change a letter in fat to make it say fan. Type the new word in the chat box. Don't press enter yet. Change that to make it say fan. So everyone should be typing. Three, two, one, enter. I see one that says fan. Let, oh, I see a lot in the open box. Sweet, we got a couple more coming in. Next one, your turn. Change a letter in fan to make it say can. Change a letter in fan to make it say can. Three, two, one, enter. Can, yes, I see some more coming in. So you get the idea, you'll have this and students can type in. If they needed more scaffolding, I could say change the last letter to make it say cat. So I'm thinking of can, change the last letter to make it say cat. So I'm giving them a little more scaffolding. Now they know what letter they need to pay attention to and then have them type it or hold up their box and they would come up with the word cat. And then we can get them with another clue back to the beginning word. So again, that letter sound relationship, multiple opportunities for students to practice, providing feedback and error correction as needed. And then as you're typing in, I'm able to see very quickly, do you understand the concept that we're working on? So a way to really get in um, those practice opportunities for students and really make that um, instruction explicit and systematic by really incorporating those pieces um, of that explanation, the teacher model, the student practice, and those checks for understanding. 
systematic instruction is really taking a skill and breaking it down into um, smaller tasks or smaller steps. So when I'm thinking about teaching students with dyslexia, how can I take a large task, reading and decoding an entire story into those smaller tasks that gradually build in complexity, all based around word level reading difficulties. So as I'm looking at words in a huge text that I'm wanting students to read, what are those more sim simplistic tasks that have to kind of be addressed first? So first I would want to focus on sound spellings with a picture cue and giving students a lot of core programs in tier one have these sound spellings with picture cues. Here we're working on O and O consonant E. And then we would blend words using that spelling pattern. So I've taught this simple skill of O and O consonant E. Now we're getting a little more complex and building that in with sounds you already know and your new targeted sound. A little more complex, having you read and write words using that sound spelling pattern at the word level and then build to that more complex, that most complex task in this scenario is reading decodable text with those sound spelling patterns. So starting off in a more simple task, gradually building to that more difficult task of reading these words in connected text with accuracy and fluency, getting you then to that comprehension. So looking at adjusting the intensity of instruction, um, looking at prior to adjusting that intensity of instruction, as we're thinking about students who may not be um, completely successful in tier one and may need that additional um, layer or two of support in tier two and tier three, looking at how can I adjust that intensification across those tiers. So ensuring curriculum has been implemented as designed for a, a sufficient amount of time is kind of that first step. I can't say, oh, students need tier three if I haven't delivered sufficient and adequate um, instruction tier one and tier two. So making sure that instruction has been provided. Using data, um, as Scott talked about in that universal screening, identifying those students who are at risk and then he'll talk a little more um, in a few minutes about looking more explicitly at that data to really identify additional areas or enhancements. Considering areas to intensify, the NCII intervention and checklist is a really great place to start with that. And also your um, document that M my MTSS just put out helps with that as well. Developing a plan and then implementing that plan to see if what we planned actually was implemented and did it work or not. So collecting data as we're implementing that plan. And then really the idea that that data and instructional decisions are intertwined. Data is not happening without informing instruction. Instructing is not happening without gathering some form of data. So really looking at how those two align with one another as we're intensifying instruction. So we know if things are working or if they're not working. And if they're not, what can we do to change it? This is the resource again that um, I've referenced a couple of times already, looking at intensifying literacy instruction and those essential practices. So the little chart where it showed you which skills were being taught per grade level is from this resource. The link is also here. Um, and I think Melissa put it in the chat box a little bit ago too. Um, so you have several places that you could access that essential practices guide. What does more intensity mean? What does it mean to, intensif um, to intensify instruction? It really means we're making that instruction more explicit, we're making it um, more direct instruction, more modeling, more practice, more monitoring and feedback, more time and more data. So really adding that intensity by adding more of any or all of those things um, and really being strategic about what we choose to intensify. This is kind of the slide about more intensity in picture form. So looking at um, student one and student two really being the focus of this slide. And as they move across the tiers of support, that um, instruction is getting more explicit, more systematic, increasing in more intensity through more opportunities to respond, more data collected, more um, honing in on targeted skills that may not be as targeted in tier one, but can be more targeted as they move across um, that continuum from tier two and tier three. Likely it's going to be an increase in time as well. They're getting their 90 minute reading block plus an additional time for tier two and in some cases an additional time for tier three as well. Um, so really thinking about those one, those students one and two and how it's getting more intensive as their group is getting smaller, they're getting more time and that instruction is becoming more targeted based on their individual need as they move um, kind of through those tiers of prevention. 
And what's different across the tiers, really looking at how tier one has some I do, we do, you do. And each of those become increasingly more involved and explicit as we move across those tiers. In tier one, not to discount the y'all do, there's power in um, working in partners and pairs and sharing out and discussion in tier one too. But you'll see that really um, beefs up in that tier two and tier three. Lots and lots and lots of practice with the content being taught on those targeted skills in with a teacher, with students on their own, with teacher feedback. So really looking at that increased um, practice and increased modeling and increased intensity as you move from tier one, tier two, and tier three. Research on intensification does tell us several things. Um, really helpful to align instruction with learner needs, um, making sure that we're using data to address those learner needs and picking curriculum and choosing strategies that really hone in on those skills, integrating strategies that support cognitive processes, um, and then looking at differentiated instructional delivery, again, making it more explicit and more systematic as we're moving across those tiers, increasing time and reducing group size are all ways that we can really um, intensify instruction for students. This is looking at intensifying by writing and again, looking at orthographic mapping and memory through a strategy that's trace, copy, cover, and compare. So for this particular strategy, students can kind of warm up as they're reading looking at um, their letters being seen in their words and then writing those letters, practicing the letter name and the letter sound. So they can trace the letter starting on the green dot, copy the letter on their paper, cover the letter, working from their working memory, compare their letter when I uncover it. Does your letter match my letter? As they're writing it, they can say S says S, S. So they're practicing those um, mapping skills and we can go to the next letter. Have them trace the letter, have them write the letter, cover their letter, write it, uncover, and compare. Does yours match mine? Choose your best M that you wrote today. So kind of going through that process, working on tracing, copy, covering, comparing, it gives them that cognitive processing procedural checklist that's kind of integrated into this writing activity. Also works on their working memory because they're covering and having to write that letter from memory. Um, so a really easy way to integrate orthographic mapping, cognitive processing through that simple checklist and that working memory, covering it, writing it, and then uncovering to compare. And then lastly, looking at another resource um, is from the, the National Center, NCII, National Center on Intensive Intervention. Um, they do have an intervention intensity um, taxonomy that looks at seven different dimensions and how each of those could be increased in intensity. And we won't go into every single one of those now, um, but know that there are some of those resources on the web for NCII and I'll kind of demo that really quickly where to find those. There are in your PowerPoint some guiding questions around each of those um, areas of intensification that you can look at a little closer as you're looking to intensify instruction for students with dyslexia. And then there's also some planning guides on NCII's website. So I'm going to switch over really quickly for us to do a real quick pause um, and peruse for the NCII website, just so you can see what that site looks like, where to find some of these resources, and I'm turning you back over to Scott. So on the NCII website, um, if you go to your tools charts on the tab for NCII, the chart that Scott referenced for the screening um, academic measures and then your behavior, your academic progress monitoring chart, that's where you can find these. So tools chart, if I click on academic screening, these are the charts that Scott was showing earlier about um, the picking a screener that had research convincing evidence behind it. And the same for um, your progress monitoring that I showed in this portion, looking at your progress monitoring tools charts, um, and there's also intervention tools charts there as well. So a resource there for you to use are tool charts. And then looking at taxonomy through the intervention materials, if I click on taxonomy of um, intervention intensity, there are tons and tons of resources around intensifying instruction for students. So um, NCII has modules. If you scroll down the page um, about the taxonomy, you have tools that you can use, strategies for scheduling for more intensive supports, um, checklists to go through as you're looking in data teams and making decisions around data for students. And then the plan that I found 
um, for in, in their intensive intervention. If you type into the search box, intervention plan for small groups, and click on that and have it search, you can then scroll down, click on intervention plan for small groups, and then you can decide whether you want to download it as a PDF or as a Word document. So as you're planning to intensify um, instruction for students at risk for dyslexia or students identified as having dyslexia, you can look at your intervention plans, write out what the plan is going to happen, how are you intensifying instruction, and then how are you implementing that plan and what data are you gathering? So really, really helpful resource to document that planning and intensification process um, for students who are at risk for reading difficulties, who you are intensifying instruction for. So I'm going to pause there. I'll turn you back over to Scott um, and we'll jump into some progress monitoring piece. Melissa, will you unmute Scott when you get a chance? It does not seem to want to let me do that. I don't have that route. I can ask him to unmute. Oh. <laughs> Scott, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, I, th I think that worked. Did that? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, I had a. I had a. The screen was popping up as a. The the first message was I couldn't. I couldn't unmute myself, but then I got a message saying that I could unmute myself. So, good. That worked. Great. Uh, thanks, Jess. That was as usual. Really good. Um, I knew it would be. Um, let's see. I've got to get to my screen, right? Oh, is that it? Oh, sorry, guys. Are you seeing me scroll through? Uh, it doesn't appear as, you're, as though you're sharing your screen right now. We oh, just okay. You. That's okay, because I have to get to the place anyway. Just a second. Um, let me see here. What do I do to share my screen? Uh, along the bottom, you should see the share screen button. And the menu. I don't see it. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, share. Beautiful. Okay. Hey, Jess, do you know what, how do I go to a slide? Do you know? I just scroll through it. Never mind. Okay, um, so the, 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 one of the takeaways from the focus on instruction and intervention that Jess just, just talked about is that there's, there's, really, there's really a, a, a lot going on. It's, it's the most complex part of a multi-tiered system. And I wanna go back just for a second to um, connect the the instruction, instruction and intervention, the big ideas that we focus on, the way that that information, that that content is delivered to a multi-tiered system. And just reinforce this point that multi-tiered systems and other school-wide models allow you all at the school level primarily, but also with, with very strong district support and support from the state to organize your system to, to support all kids. And given the complexity of instruct, reading instruction, early reading instruction, there really is a lot going on. That's always the feeling I get when I watch the presentations on instruction intervention that we do. It really requires everybody coming together to try to put a system together that's gonna work. The, the feature of the, 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 the evidence that your system is working is gonna be your student performance data. You can use screening data for that. You can use progress monitoring data for that. Um, you can use outcome data that we're that are sometimes screening measures that are used at the end of the year. You're certainly going to be using your your state level assessment data. That's going to be your arbiter of whether or not your system is working. And and um, uh, given the slide I showed earlier about the percentage of kids who are not at a proficient reading level, those are those, those include kids with reading disabilities and kids without disabilities. Uh, uh, near 50%, uh, there, there clearly is work that we can do to, to improve our reading systems. And that I would argue um, is probably something that we, can, we should try to be focusing on incremental improvements rather than trying to solve a massive problem all at once, but trying to make uh, consistent um, improvements over time. 
using student performance data to do that. Progress monitoring measures, the, 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 the major takeaway about progress monitoring measures is once you've identified that kids are, are need extra support, progress monitoring measures are gonna be your best indicator of whether or not your interventions are having the intended effect. So that means you have to do two things. You first of all have to operationalize what you, what you want student progress to be. Because if, if you don't operationalize what you want student progress to be, then you won't know if their progress is, is, is um, sufficient. The second thing, is you have to set some kind of a goal. You have to have some kind of a goal for student progress so that you can monitor a kid's progress towards some goal. That goal conceptually, right? The goal conceptually is linked to where you want your students to be reading who are proficient. Like you, where, where, where you think proficient readers are is, is connected to your goal. And then your job essentially is to monitor progress towards that goal and to evaluate on a, on a fairly regular basis, whether your support, that's your instruction and your interventions in particular, are having the intended effect. So progress monitoring is particularly critical for students who are at risk. It also can be used for kids who are not at risk. If you, if you, if you have the resources and you want to monitor kids who are not at risk more, more uh, regularly than at your um, screening benchmark time. So fall, winter, spring, you want to do it more regularly, regularly than that. That's absolutely fine. And that will give you some information about your tier one system. They're, they're the essential data source for making decisions about adjustments to instruction and intervention to support kids. That's your progress monitoring data. So you can see why it's so critical. Uh, the focus is on kids who are at risk. The purpose is to really see whether or not kids are making adequate progress. And this notion of response to intervention, RTI or response to intervention, is really a critical one. And I'll talk about that in a second. The assessments themselves are really, <clears throat> generally speaking, they're the same kinds of measures that you might use in a screening system. They may be the, the individual measures that are in the, in the screening battery. Uh, they're, they have the same characteristics. You want them to be reliable. You want them to be valid for monitoring progress and you want them to be evidence-based. And your, uh, the frequency of assessments can go anywhere from uh, sometimes weekly. Um, it's very common to assess students on a monthly basis or bi-weekly basis, but uh, there are enough progress monitoring measures out there um, to use that you can do it uh, uh, on a pretty regular basis. You typically collect multiple data points before you start making decisions about, about the rate of progress that a student is making. So from one data point to another is probably not sufficient. Somewhere along the lines of five to 10 data points are really starts to be in the realm of the number of data points that you wanna have to start drawing what we call trend lines. And that's, a, that's essentially just a line of progress that the student is making. So collecting multiple data points to draw a trend line and comparing that line, that slope of progress that the student is making to the goal is the idea behind progress monitoring measures. Uh, this is a, there's a summary here. I'm not going to really go into this. We've talked about it, I think, enough. Um, we're screening. We're really trying to identify which kids are at risk. With progress monitoring, we're really, it's a subset of students, and we're trying to figure out if kids are making adequate progress to get on track for grade level reading proficiency. Okay. Um, there, here's some characteristics of progress monitoring measures. They're usually, as I say, aligned with screening measures. They need to be used frequently. So some technical issues around the number of, of uh, progress monitoring assessments or probes you have is important. They need to be of comparable difficulty and, and um, the forms need to be comparable so that you get a consistent index of progress over time. Uh, they're usually aligned with the areas that a kid is having difficulty with and their purpose is to determine if students are making adequate progress. So they're, they're, very, they're a very important part of the system for sure. Okay, here's a simple graph that can give you, that illustrates the point. For, um, the, the, you can see that the two graphs, the kid on the left is making really good progress. Their estimated rate of increase is six words read correct per data point, which is um, really, really good. If, if we're talking about oral reading fluency, for example, 
The student on the right, you can tell by the line, is not making much progress. Their estimated rate of progress is only 0.3 words correct per, per uh, assessment point, which is quite low. This indicates, as you can, uh, as you'll all be able to tell very easily, that something uh, needs to change about the student's intervention in, in the, the, the right part of the graph. The kid on the left is making good progress. Uh, if that student continues to make that progress, more of the chances are that they will, they'll reach their goal for sure. Okay, so the idea is that you have uh, multiple data points, you're monitoring progress towards some goal. When the kid's rate of progress is below the goal line, schools come together, teachers, administrators, coaches, and so forth, they come together and they think about ways of essentially, essentially intensifying the support for students, the purpose being to increase the rate of progress. Pretty, pretty straightforward, okay. The reason this is so uh, critical, progress monitoring is so critical, is because in, uh, and I'm gonna connect this now to, to, to dyslexia in just a second, but I wanna, but I wanna draw your attention to uh, what, the, what the federal law says about specific learning disabilities. And this is a recent, this is the relatively recent change in the law, the last 10 years or so, or maybe, maybe 15. But a, but a local education agency for the first time now, they can use a process that determines if the child responds to scientific research-based intervention, scientific research-based intervention as part of the evaluation procedures for SLD determination. So measuring response is the key here, right? And that is monitoring a student's progress that's the way we operationalize a student's response to scientific research-based intervention. The reason that this is so important is because there is no dyslexia category in IDEA, okay? There's a, there's a, there's a dyslexia example. It's under specific learning disability. So by definition, according to the federal law, a student who has dyslexia has a specific learning disability. And the way specific learning disabilities are defined and, I, and, and a way, the way kids are identified as having a specific learning disability, primarily the most, the most defensible way is this notion of response to instruction and intervention. What we used to do, as many of you know, before, um, before this allowance, this allowance of response to intervention, is we assessed the, the, the intelligence of students. We gave them an IQ test. We assessed their achievement. We looked at the discrepancy between those two things. And if it was large enough, we, um, we came to the conclusion that the student had a learning disability. This was never really a very popular, um, popular approach for, for multiple reasons. Uh, it's psychometrically not defensible, to be honest. Uh, it's still in the law, but it's still a largely criticized way of determining specific learning disabilities. A better way is this notion of response to intervention. The challenge with that is measuring response, measuring uh, the intervention itself. Those are complex things that schools have to do if they're going to use this approach well. IDEA has 13 categories. Specific learning disability is one of them. These are the other categories. When kids are identified as having a disability, it has to be in one of these categories. About 30% or so of kids in, um, who are identified as having disabilities are identified in the specific learning disability category. So that's the vast majority of students who are identified as having disabilities. SLD is an umbrella term that includes dyslexia. So dyslexia is housed within specific learning disability and it also includes dysgraphia, dyscalculia, <laughs> this, this, this is a math problem, calculation problem, auditory processing disorders, nonverbal learning disabilities. Those are all examples that are under SLD. The key, however, is that in any SLD identification, measuring response to intervention is critical. It includes two major considerations, assessing the child, their progress, which we've been talking about to instruction intervention, but it also requires that we assess implementation of instruction intervention to make sure that the kid's progress is not due to incomplete or problematic um, intervention. So that we, we, so we operationalize what we want the intervention to look like. We make sure that the intervention is implemented the way we intend 
then we can be assured that the student's response, if it's low, has to do more potentially with a disability than, um, than uh, the instruction intervention. So we talked about screening assessments. We've talked about progress monitoring assessments. The last feature and the one that schools are starting to embrace a little bit um, more seriously, the one that is more complex for, for a number of reasons, uh, is measuring implementation. Some people talk about this as a fidelity of implementation. We talk about it as um, an implementation assessment, but the point is to gather data on implementation. And there's a number of ways of doing that. I'll talk about a few, but the point really is to make sure that when we provide interventions to kids, the interventions are being implemented as intended. Okay, when we think about what's, what's implemented, you can think about the, the three things, uh, I think. Reading instruction and intervention is being implemented. Just talked a lot about what that looks like. We also have professional development and coaching that are being implemented to support teachers and interventionists. We also have leadership that's organized around setting up an MTSS system, um, providing resources to support that system, evaluating the effectiveness, the effectiveness of that system over time. All of those things are implemented and because they're implemented, they should be evaluated at some level, okay? So we should be looking pretty carefully at tiers one, two, and three, collecting data on implementation. This is not a small um, challenge. It's pretty, it's pretty significant. It requires people working together, of course. It's not for um, evaluating teachers. That should not be the purpose. It should be for evaluating an overall system, the MTSS system, making sure implementa implementation is being delivered the way we intend it to be delivered. There are different ways of collecting data. I've listed three types of data there. I wanna talk about three aspects of, of implementation. These are conceptual in nature. So uh, there are ideas about how to think about this. One, one is structural aspects of instruction. Group size, start and stop times being um, aligned with what we want, things like that. Things that you can typically um, think about before you would go in to visit or observe in a classroom. The essential components of reading, which just talked about phonemic awareness, phonics, comprehension, vocabulary, reading fluency, those essential components of reading, we can, we can, we can determine how well those are being implemented high quality instructional practices, systematic and explicit instruction, which we talked a lot about, opportunities for students to be engaged, feedback that kids get, extending instructional interactions during the course of the lesson, those kinds of things are, are instructional practices that cut across really subject areas. So they can be applied to mathematics, writing instruction, reading instruction, uh, and so forth, okay? Finally, um, we have an example here of, of um, of a, pr a principal walk through measure. And I, the, the point I wanna make here is, is not so much about this measure per se, but I want to encourage leaders, building leaders, coaches, but, but who will know a lot about the reading system, but building leaders in particular to really understand, and I know this is a time issue and I know building leaders are very busy, but I think the degree to which they can really understand the system, the reading system that's being implemented in the building, the details, many of the details that Jess talked about, to the degree that they can understand that and that they can visit classrooms and observe what's going on, the purpose of providing formative feedback to, the, to, to folks who are involved in implementing the system, I think is, is really, really critical. I know that walkthroughs are a common thing, and I know that they're sometimes very, very, um, the principals, for example, can do them in a pretty in a pretty um, reasonable amount of time, and it's a priority for them. But uh, if principals can understand some of those features that we talked about, core the core content that we should be that should be taught in in the great early grades reading content, the way that instruction should be should be delivered, the principals then can start to look for these features as they do their visits in classrooms, and get a good understanding of how the system is actually being implemented on the ground. Okay, once we get to the point where we've got screening kids, we're providing robust instruction intervention, we're monitoring progress, and uh, we still have some students who are not responding, we do need to, to consider some exclusionary factors um, before we engage in the comprehensive process of evaluating a student for 
um, special education eligibility under the category of specific learning disability, of which dyslexia is an example. So we wanna rule out things. And we, most importantly, we wanna make sure that the system itself has been implemented, um, implemented as intended. Okay, that becomes part of the part of the comprehensive evaluation um, that will include standardized assessments that are given to, to, to students. It will include a family history. There are lots of, there's lots of information about that that we're starting to understand better actually. Uh, those, are, those are comprehensive evaluations that will become part of the overall evaluation for, for special education eligibility. And that's really the way that a student then is identified as having a specific learning disability, including dyslexia. Okay. I'm going to wrap up here because I want you guys to be able to take the, the, the last assessment. This is just a summary. We've talked about MTSS. We've talked about data utilization from kids and implementation data. Most importantly, I would argue, we've talked about what the instruction and intervention system should look like for providing services to students. Okay. Now, can we, um, can we, can we do the, can we still do the, the, uh, the, the, um, the knowledge test? I will launch that poll. There is a question in the Q&A, Scott. I'm wondering oh, yeah. if you might be able to address that while I launch Yeah, you bet. Uh-huh. Yes, I will. Let's see. Oh, here, oh, here it is. Sorry. Um, what about districts where RTI systems aren't uh, built enough to make sure the winner? Uh, so uh, the question is about determinations of that and the use of, oh, patterns of strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, I sorry, I wasn't, I was, I wasn't um, registering patterns of strengths and weaknesses. Yeah, so there's another, there, there's another um, approach. It's identified in the law, which essentially is uh, examining patterns of strengths and weaknesses that kids have on standardized assessments. It's very, it's similar conceptually to, to a, to an aptitude achievement discrepancy score, measuring intelligence, measuring achievement, looking at the discrepancy, discrepancy between the two. Patterns of strengths and weaknesses is similar. To be perfectly honest, um, I, there's, there's not a lot of good evidence that this methodology for making decisions about, about special education eligibility is, uh, there, is valid. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that it, that it, there won't be evidence that determines that it's valid, but right now there's not a lot of evidence supporting it. And what happens, I mean, it's, there are kind of technical issues around this, but what happens with patterns of strengths and weaknesses is that you can, one of the, one of the potential problems is that you can gather so much data and look at so many different patterns is eventually you're going to find some pattern. You're going to find some areas where there's discrepancies, there's strengths and there's weaknesses. Uh, and if you don't take into account the fact that you've, that you've looked at a lot of other patterns where there hasn't been discrepancies, you can run into um, validity issues with that analysis. So um, until there's better data, from my perspective, on patterns of strengths and weaknesses, I would, I would use it cautiously. I think there's much more evidence that something like a uh, response to intervention approach, conceptually anyway, is more valid, uh, but, that, but will, time will tell. Scott. Yeah, there, there was a there's a question there was a, a comment about um, that there the, the basically the point and I know we have to wrap up but the point is that um, um, many school because RT, RTI and MTSS is complex and there are um, to be perfectly honest there are many many schools that are um, say that they're using MTSS, but when we have a chance to look at kind of what those schools are doing, we see that the, 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 um, some features are not being 
not being implemented the way they should be, basically. They're not comprehensive approaches. So we, I tend to use the term comprehensive approaches to MTSS, where all of these features are in place. There's, there's a professional development and coaching system. There's instruction and intervention. There's leadership. There's a system of a student assessments. They're all aligned. And there's evidence, ongoing collection of data to provide evidence that the system is working. That's a pretty high bar, I realize. Um, and what do you do in, in schools where those systems are not in place? You've still got to support students. You've still got to be involved in special education eligibility making. I totally get that. I don't think there's, there's a simple answer to that. Um, but there are, there are certainly issues with aptitude achievement discrepancy scores. And I think that there's the same argument is made for patterns of strength and weaknesses. Uh, those are our options, those three, in, in, in addition to uh, RTI for determining that students are eligible for special education. Um, so we, I think part of our solution is to be to look carefully at our school-wide systems like MTSS and improve them. Thanks, Scott. Um, hey, Jess, I think, I think we're done. Do you wanna, any, anything else you wanna summarize with? I know we have chats coming in. I'm going to check the questions today as well. I mean, check the, the comments. Oh, thank you. Thanks for that. I don't know if Jess is stuck and can't get off of mute again. Thank I you. did put in the chat box the link to the evaluation for today's session. I know that uh, last time uh, Nancy and Brian, and then this time I'm sure Scott and Jess will be looking at that information in order to um, help inform the third session in the series. Uh, Jess just put up the QR code if you wanna to get to the evaluation that way, um, or you can use the link in the chat. And I just wanna thank both uh, Jess, and, Jess and Scott for a wonderful session today. Um, I know there are, if there are any other questions, you feel free to top, pop them in the Q&A or the chat and if we don't get to answer them now, we'll, we'll get answers to folks, but we thank yeah. you all for your time. And thank you. Can I just make one plug for the third session with Sarah Seiko and, and Jess? Um, this this is going. Th this will be a really great session. Sarah is took has taken the lead on the family issue for family component for for Ensel. She's got she's got deep knowledge. I haven't seen Jess and Sarah do this together, but I think it will be. I, I really think it will be excellent. I know the content that Sarah has talked about in the past is really. Um, it's it's both conceptual and um, practical, and I think very provocative. Her orientation, I love it, and I, and I uh, would uh, encourage you just, just for the fun of it, but also professionally, to attend the session and, 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 and see what you think. Great, and that is um, not next week, but the week after that. Two weeks from today, I think, yeah. Thank you so much, Jess, Jess and Scott. You just nailed it. It was a great, great couple of hours. Oh, thank you, Kim. Thanks a lot. Nice to hear from you. Yes. Have a good evening, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks a lot. We appreciate your, your taking the time with us. Thanks a lot. Bye.